As our final justice today, we have uh, the opportunity to listen to uh, Justice uh, Rosalie Silberman Abella. Uh, in addition to being a great jurist, uh, Justice Abella started her life as a great pianist and probably would have been playing in Carnegie Hall had she practiced piano instead of practicing law. And, um, but she practiced law and she became a child judge. At the age of 29, she was appointed to the bench. She was appointed to the bench where she served with great, great distinction until she was appointed to the Supreme Court, the first uh, Jewish woman ever to be appointed to the Supreme Court of Canada. I'm sure you will not be the last because your contributions have been so distinguished. And so it's my great personal pleasure to introduce my friend and somebody who I have tremendous admiration for, Justice Rosalie Abella. You noticed? Yeah. Well, first of all, um, I want to say what a privilege it is to be here and what an honor to have been included. Um, Erwin Kotler and Alan Dershowitz have organized an extraordinary conference, and to be able to participate with my friends, um, Dorit Banish and John Dyson, and my new friend, Sam Brujeji, my new BFF, um, is, is really something I will never forget. But I have also been given the honor of being able to close the conference. And so to the extent that I have personal remarks, I hope you'll forgive me. I want to speak to you as a judge um, and leave the personal to the end, except for this. This is a particularly meaningful opportunity for me to speak to you at the Jagalonian University because it's the university my father graduated from in 1935, 1934. So to be here speaking as a judge of the Supreme Court of Canada in this university is something I could never have imagined. Secondly, Nuremberg and I were born in the same year and in the same country. So I have an intense interest in what happens to both of them. And looking at the theme of this conference from the perspective of a Canadian judge who has the great good luck to live in a vibrant democracy with a robust system of rights, um, a strong independent judiciary, there are certain themes um, that emerge from the discussions that we've heard this morning and even this afternoon that I want to touch on. Um, from 10,000 feet. And I use the Cutlerian device of first, second, third, fourth, fifth. As if you know Irwin, that's what happens. It's a list. And I thought, well, you know, that works. And what does it come to? About a half a dozen concepts that I think really um, play a prominent role in what we're thinking about today. And what's the summary that I want you to think about as you listen? I took seriously the double entendre message of this conference, and I thought double entendre is not unlike the story I heard many years ago about the journalist who was in Israel and was doing interviews with people in the street and came to somebody and said, I'm doing an interview about the situation in Israel. I only have time on the tape for one word. Um, can you tell me about what you think about what's going on in Israel in one word? And the person said, that's ridiculous. I can't answer any question in one word. He said, I'm sorry, that's all the time I have on my tape. Fine. So the tape starts rolling, and the journalist says, so how would you describe conditions in Israel today? And he said, good. And then the camera stopped, and the journalist said, so if we'd had time for two words, what would you have said? He said, not good. <laughs> So my themes are good, not good. Uh, there's Nuremberg is good. I'm not so sure about what we've done since. But let's start with the, with the first one. And that is the rule of law. I, I confess to being someone who has um, a certain amount of skepticism about the use of the word rule of law. And it comes from a Holocaust background. The Holocaust was not illegal, as you saw this morning, under German law. So 
the rule of law can be immoral. Segregation was under the rule of law. Apartheid was under the rule of law. So why do we keep using a term very few people understand, except in its aspirational sense? We want a certain kind of rule of law. So let's talk about what we deeply aspire to in a rule of law. We want freedom from arbitrary government. We want an independent press. We want an independent bar and judiciary. Uh, we want protection for minorities. We want the things that democracy protects. So why don't we just stop using phrases people have difficulty understanding and just say, we need to protect democracy and all of the things that are intended with it. Which brings me to democracy. So democracy I have seen, democracy I thought was what emerged triumphant. Um, the vindication of morality, democracy, uh, the role of a just rule of law. Democracy is not just about majorities. We learned that, as uh, Dorit Bainer said, democracy is the right sometimes to be free from what the majority wants. Democracy is not just about elections. That's the beginning of the conversation. It's the door that lets you in. But democracy can't grow up except in a proper home, and that home needs due process, independent judges, independent lawyers, a good, healthy, free press. So that's two. What's the state of democracy? Well, I think anybody reading a newspaper would say this is something about which we need to be continually vigilant because democracy is increasingly being equated with elections. So, I mean, uh, this worries me because it means that you can have the kind of arbitrariness we were trying to deal with at Nuremberg. Not to the same extent, but we made a commitment then to the, uh, to the contextual part of democracy and we need to make sure that we keep that. And if we're talking about the role of democracy, we then have to talk about the role of the judiciary in the democracy. This was one of the most difficult things, I think, for me to read about, and that is the role of judges during um, the Third Reich. Ingo Mueller wrote an excellent book called Hitler's Justice, the Courts of the Third Reich. And the judges were complicit with their technical interpretations in imposing the laws without any sense of the morality of the laws. So it was something for me that made me realize that the whole debate about judges should not interpret, judges should not make law, they should only interpret law. Anyone who's familiar with how the judges in the Third Reich interpreted the, the laws, Hitler's laws, and enforced them understands how important it is to have an independent judiciary. Then bring that forward. So now we have a view that judges shouldn't be too independent. There are those who say, well, if you're too independent, then you're activist. And if you're activist, then you are trespassing on legislative territory. Instead of understanding that independent judges are supposed to hold government to account for breaches of rights. And they can't do that unless they're independent. Activism is a term that tends to be used by those who disagree with a decision, but it is not a concept. It's not a legal concept, but it's been conveniently used, and I find it very, very troubling. Role of the media. The Stryker trial, the role of Der Sturmer, taught us the power of words and how incitement can cause hatred. And so we moved away from thinking there was war and there was words. Words can lead to destruction. Um, but you know, it has come to where we have seen freedom of expression so flexibly that we don't understand. We have forgotten, in a way, the harm that can be caused by some words. And the collision between freedom of expression and freedom from discrimination isn't something we've yet worked out. And in Canada, we have a commitment to preventing hate speech on the theory that there is a difference between yelling fire in a crowded theater and yelling theater in a crowded fire hall. So 
importance of the media, importance of the media being able to call to account governments who trespass on democratic rights, which brings us to the role of international law. One of the most intriguing things about the development of international law, do you have water by any chance? It was fascinating to read about the way international law was almost in a, in a state of uh, stagnation when the Allies were trying to figure out what to do when the war ended with uh, the perpetrators of the war. Was there such a thing as a war of aggression, a war against peace? Could we really prosecute for war crimes? We've never done anything like holding a state accountable for crimes it commits against its own citizens. And it was the kind of discussion that I think is the biggest problem for international law. Nobody seems to know what it was. You had on the one hand, people like Lauterpacht, um, Telford Taylor, Robert Jackson, Bernays, the man who came up with the idea of these trials, who said, we have to have some accountability. The, whether international law said it before, it certainly said there shouldn't be crimes, and it's outrageous not to prosecute people for these crimes. They won the day at Nuremberg. We now have, and that's how international law develops. So it was the flowering of international law because it had been so unclear what does customary international law mean? What is jus cogens? What is a peremptory norm? Something that nobody can derogate from. But here we are, all these years later, 70 years later, and what are we listening to? Debates about whether certain crimes, certain events, certain behavior violates the rules of customary international law, instead of appreciating that it is like the common law, it grows, and the judiciary has to do its part to bring international law in line with current and modern realities. Which brings me to uh, the role of enforcement. One of the major problems with international law is the lack of enforcement. Um, some, uh, an American scholar once said, the road to hell has been paved with good conventions. We have all kinds of rhetoric. We have all kinds of laws. We have no enforcement mechanisms. If you take a moment to compare international law, human rights law, with international trade law, it's quite breathtaking. In 1994, the Marrakesh Agreement set up the World Trade Organization. It has an enforcement mechanism. It's very hard to join WTO. Um, there is uh, compliance with international trade law. Compare that, and that's something that just took place 21 years ago. Compare that with international human rights law, which is still struggling for enforcement mechanisms from the global community. So where does all, all of this take us? Rule of law, role of democracy, um, role of independent media, role of the judiciary, role of an international law, role of enforcement. It means we have to go back to what we started with and the commitment we made at Nuremberg. We understood then that justice is the application of law to life, and that means democracy. Without democracy, there aren't any rights. Without any rights, there's no justice, and without justice, there's no hope. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>